the book that you just wrote, The Plant Paradox, uh, that is, uh, by the way, congratulations, number two in the New York Times list. Thank you very much. That's appreciate awesome. It. Congratulations, and I hope uh, those of you who have gotten the book uh, uh, have enjoyed it so far, and those of you who have not, uh, I urge you to get it. Uh, not for the theory, we're gonna talk about the theory. In the back of the book, Dr. Gundry has got uh, actually very practical um, what to eat, how to eat, recipes, uh, uh, sort of uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner suggestions, which makes eating what you're proposing a lot more uh, palatable and doable. Because the fact of the matter is, uh, what, what you've identified here is that a lot of the things that we currently eat that we think of as healthy are in fact uh, not. In fact, they're attacking us. Correct. And let's, let's just jump into, into the meat of that right perfect, now. Perfect. Because I think that's the important thing yep. to realize. Like, at the end of the day, I want uh, our viewers to know what the hell do we eat and what don't, what don't we want to eat and why. Because you've changed my diet like you know, 80% of what I... Uh, Sorry uh, about that. No, it's fine. It makes it really <laughs> tough to explain to people I have to go into the entire theory of lectin. And I met this guy, Dr. Gundry, through my dear friend, Tony Robbins, who's a dear friend of ours both. So let's jump in. What do we, what don't we, and why? Okay, plants don't like us. I, uh, they were here first. Yeah. <laughs> they had it great. Nobody wanted to eat them. When their predators arrived, they had a problem. They couldn't run, they couldn't hide, they couldn't fight. But they're chemists, as you and I know, yes. of incredible ability. Almost all drugs come from a plant compound. And so they use chemical warfare to keep us, their predator, from eating them. And they use lectins, which are proteins that are basically designed to hack our system in many ways. But the fundamental principle of lectins are, I like to pe have people think of these as basically incoming guided missile attacks. Mm -hmm. And lectins like to pry apart the wall of our intestine. And most people don't realize that inside of us, the surface area of the intestines is equivalent to a tennis court in surface area, mm -hmm. every one of us. And the, the wall of the intestine is only one cell thick. And the cells are all held together by little tight junctions like kids playing Red Rover, Red Rover. And lectins actually flip a switch and pop these tight junctions apart. And then lectins, which are a foreign protein, get through the wall of our gut, but they also take with them, what we talk about in the book, are bacterial particles, cell walls, uh, called lipopolysaccharides. Right. They're abbreviated LPSs. And You're bringing back very many ancient memories from medical school. <laughs> so I don't swear, but I call them little pieces of shit in the book because that's actually what they are. And so... <laughs> If you want to think about our immune system, our immune system is the border patrol on the other side of our gut. And when foreign proteins, aliens, come across our border, our immune system goes, oh my gosh, the illegal aliens have crossed the border, we're under attack, we should scramble the fighter jets, we should go to threat level five, and wherever we see any protein that looks like a lectin or a little piece of shit, we should open fire mm -hmm. and ask questions later. The idea is to create inflammation, yes. and inflammation makes an animal feel lousy or not thrive. And that's how plants win. So at the end of the day, um, uh, we know one of these lectins. Uh, the whole society has gone on a gluten-free diet uh, because you have this, you know, oh, I'm, I've got gluten intolerance, I've got gluten intolerance, everybody talks about gluten intolerance and so forth, and that's just one of the minor lectins, if you would. Correct. Right? Yeah. And we don't talk about all the other lectins that potentially could be hitting you. Right. So why, why, did, why did gluten get such a special showing? Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. It, it truly is a lectin, and there are 2 to 5% of people who clearly carry genes for gluten intolerance, for celiac disease, mm -hmm. the extreme form of gluten intolerance. But let me just add, if you take people with celiac disease and put them on a gluten-free diet, and they're saints, and re-biopsy their intestines two years later, 83% of them will still have celiac disease 
even though they're, they're eating gluten-free. So that actually proves that gluten is just one little piece of this puzzle. And what I try to convince people is that most people who are eating a gluten-free diet are eating a heavy lectin-laden diet. So give me the, <laughs> uh, the top five or ten things that contain lectins that you that I used to be eating and, and all of you are eating that you don't realize you're eating. So where are lectins prevalent okay. in the diet? So all grains have lectins, whether they're healthy grains. One of the things that's happened to us in the last 50 years is we have actually bought hook, line, and sinker the idea of whole grain goodness. Yeah. We've always thrown the haul away from grains. We, believe it or not, have been trying to make bread white for 10,000 years and only the poor people got the brown bread. The French eat white baguettes. The Italians eat white pasta. Can you imagine an Italian eating whole wheat pasta? I mean, it's just, that's crazy. So because grains. we've been getting rid of the, the lectins in grains. Now, the other is beans. Beans are a modern food as well. That pissed me off, man. I was like, I'd gone vegan, I was like being a vegetarian, and then all of a sudden, I, mean the, you know, I was getting my protein from beans, I was so proud, and then boom. I mean, you're absolutely right. Beans are really heavy in lectins. Yeah, and unfortunately, you can soak beans and get some of the lectins out, and you can cook beans and get some of the lectins out, but they're still heavy in lectins. The only way to get it out is a pressure cooker. And I, I was doing a podcast yesterday with a vegan chef who has a best-selling book, and she wanted me on her podcast, and she decided to go on the Plant Paradox program and uh, to test it out. Yeah. And so she was, has been on it for about a month. And she says, okay, I'm going to start this podcast because I did this to prove you wrong <laughs> because you know, I'm a thriving vegan and I chose vegan for lots of reasons. But... She said, you're right. She said, I can't believe how much better I feel following your vegan diet. There's a, there's a vegan version in the, in the book. There's a vegetarian ve version in the book. She said, you took away what I thought every vegan had to eat to be healthy. And when I took those out of my diet, she said, you're right. I hate to admit it, but I'm here on the podcast telling you you were right. And this is actually the response I get from almost every human being, including myself. Um, so grains? <laughs> okay, grains and beans. And beans? And, then and American plants. American plants. So this is interesting, right? I love this. Again, it's, it's about logic, right? Uh, most of us didn't evolve in America uh, 100,000 or a million years ago. We were alive in the savannas of Africa. Yeah, we all came from Africa. Yeah. Um, and none of us from America are from America. We're from Europe, Asia, or Africa. Yeah. So none of us have ever encountered an American plant. Or our genomics didn't encounter it. Correct. Yeah. Or our microbiome. Or our microbiome, yeah. Uh, until 500 years ago, when Columbus started trade. Well, there, there are the American Indians uh, watching who probably... But they're Asian, uh, yeah. no offense. <laughs> over, over across the... Uh, <laughs> they, you came here about 11,000 years ago, so yeah. we're, we're all from somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and we're all originally from Africa. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> so, so our genomics evolved for a non-American plant diet. And so what are the American plants that we are eating that we shouldn't be? So the two beans that are peanuts and cashews, they're beans, they're not nuts, they're American. Uh, peanuts are some of the most deadly foods ever found. The nightshade family, potatoes, eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, and goji berries. Goji berries are American. They were called the wolfberry. They were taken to China in trade, and they grew extremely well. So these are all nightshades. And the, the sad thing is, in general, the peels and the seeds uh, have the lectins. And Italians, as you probably know, uh, traditionally peel and de-seed their tomatoes yep. before you make sauce. And uh, my mother's mother was French, and she taught my mother to always peel and de-seed a tomato before we ate them. And because that's where the lectins because are. Because that's where the lectins are, and they yeah. were removing them. Yeah. The same way with peppers. You'll never open a glass jar of Italian bell peppers and see peels and seeds, because they're gone. Uh, the Southwest American Indians always char and de-seed their peppers before they grind them into chili powder or mm. eat them. You'll never open a can of green chilies and see peels and seeds because they've been removed. Interesting. So traditional cultures have dealt with lectins, and we've kind of 
forgotten all that. And it's fascinating. They dealt with it not by knowing the molecular biology, but by trial and error. Yeah, they, they knew how it made them feel. Yeah. In fact, there's the, the old joke that no sane individual would ever take a second bite of a jalapeno pepper. <laughs> 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 and if you think about it from a plant standpoint, the plants go, what do I have to do to stop you eating my babies? Yeah. So, um, so in the book, you talk about the, and I remember when I first met, uh, you were so kind to spend a couple hours and, and, and made my life very easy by having the eat, these are things you can eat and these are things you shouldn't eat. And it just, it changed where I shop, it changed what I eat, it changed everything. Now. Um, at the end of the day, I want to now talk about uh, the impact it has because uh, the impact is on number one, weight reduction, we'll come to that in a moment, but the second is if you've got an autoimmune disease. I mean, you have had miraculous results with uh, people with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or polymyaldramatica or a whole range of other autoimmune diseases. So can you talk about um, the autoimmune elements uh, and the weight loss and then cardiac as well. Yeah. I mean, are, are, there, are those the three major categories you would, you would say? Or Yeah. In, in fact, the longer I do this now, um, you know, I think Hippocrates' uh, statement uh, keeps ringing in my ears and I think most of us forgot it. So Hippocrates said that all disease begins in the gut. But he said that every creature has this uh, ability to heal itself, to have perfect health. And he called it the green life force energy, which is kind of hokey, but that's what he called it. It sounds better in Greek or Latin. Uh, and so the purpose of a physician was to identify the obstacles that was keeping the green life force energy from having perfect health in, in a person mm -hmm. and to remove those obstacles. And then the person would heal himself. And what I found, uh, I'm a pretty good detective, is by removing things from people, they all heal themselves. So I won't heal rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I identify what's giving them rheumatoid arthritis, get it out of their diet, and then they heal themselves. Hippocrates was right. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, I was speaking to an infectious physician, one of the top ID doctors here in LA, and uh, we were talking about the notion that his belief is that all autoimmune diseases, all rheumatoid type diseases, actually begin uh, through an infectious process. It's your, your body having, uh, your immune system basically identifying some kind of a alien protein maybe with part of your molecular structure and and turning on an immune cell that attacks it and then when the infection is gone you still keep attacking yourself. Yeah I think that's a very uh, reasonable idea. Um, we know that there's a lot of people who we can trace the beginning of their autoimmune disease to uh, an infection, a viral gastroenteritis, you know, stomach flu. Uh, we can trace it to somebody getting a ton of antibiotics and killing off their microbiome. Uh, certainly, we've seen people with a stressful encounter. Uh, I remember one woman very clearly in Santa Barbara. Her rheumatoid arthritis started a, a week after her mother's sudden death when she was about 13 years of age. She remembers it vividly, and now she doesn't have it anymore, but what happened was she had leaky gut from that shock. And one thing I like to use as an example, we know that marathon runners, uh, elite marathon runners, get a profound leaky gut. Hmm. And you actually see marathon runners towards the end of, of, of a race have bloody diarrhea uh, as they near the finish line. And our immune system in marathon running takes this tremendous hit for about two weeks and the gut becomes permeable. But so I think again, I think Hippocrates is right that it starts in the gut. Now whether a bacteria gets through, whether a lectin gets through, whether both accomplish it. Lectins are interesting because they are proteins and proteins uh, that look a lot like other proteins in our in our body and it's called molecular mimicry 
And the idea is when your immune system is activated, it, it doesn't want to make a mistake, and it would rather shoot first and ask questions later. So if, imagine your fighter jets are scrambled and they come across your thyroid gland and there's lectins or other proteins that look like lectins and your, thi and your immune system says, oh my gosh, you know, this poor woman, her thyroid's full of lectins and we should kill them. And it's amazing the number of people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis that it actually has come from their gut, whether it's... You know, and, and, permeability. And, uh, and what you've shown is if you change your diet, you can calm your immune system down in that regard. Correct. And how fast can you do that? Well, I was naive early on that I thought it could be done in a couple of weeks. Um, it, it takes a while primarily because you have to change your microbiome. The microbiome can change fairly rapidly, but then you have to go about sealing the wall of your gut. We need to think of our microbiome as this uh, tropical rainforest, mm -hmm. which is an incredible ecosystem in and of itself. There's 10,000 different denizens living in there, and they compete for space, and they compete for food. And so it's an incredible ecosystem. And one, for instance, round of antibiotics, as you and I know, will wipe out this ecosystem. Yep. And it may take two years to get this ecosystem back to its complexity. Uh, so it can take three months, six months. I've seen it take as long as a year, but usually three to six months. And last fall, I had the honor of giving a paper at the uh, International Microbiota Meeting in Paris at the Pasteur Institute of 78 pa patients with uh, marker-proven autoimmune diseases who, following this program, became marker negative within the year and stayed marker negative as long as they followed the program.